Let's dive into the psychology behind large language models like ChatGPT. And to start with, I have the least relevant, but most exciting research paper that I have ever talked about on this channel, hands down. And that's because it involves both my passion for artificial intelligence and my absolute love for the intelligence of the mighty honeybee. Yes, the insect that you see in our logo and our B-roll and all that stuff. So a new paper that was published on eLife called How Honeybees Make Fast and Accurate Decisions focuses on the decision-making strategies of the honeybee. And then it aims to apply those decision-making skills to artificial intelligence. Despite having brains the size of a sesame seed, bees can make critical decisions swiftly and accurately, outperforming humans in situations that matter to them. So in controlled experiments, researchers taught the bees to recognize these different colored flower discs in different situations. And then they observed the decision-making process. Honeybees on average take 0.6 seconds to decide if they wanna land on a flower. Well, that is if they're confident that it has food or decide to avoid it if it doesn't. Now, if they're unsure, the decision-making time increases to 1.4 seconds. I mean, basically they hesitate. They're rethinking the probability of where the food should be. Now, to understand the neuromechanics that are underlying this kind of decision-making, researchers developed a computational model that mirrors this exact kind of decision-making process, showing a striking similarity to the same physical layout of the honeybee brain. And maybe this kind of study will help inspire more people to look at biological algorithms to help improve autonomous robots, maybe even help revolutionize the way that we think about AI and autonomous robots. Never underestimate the mighty honeybee. A quick side note before I jump to the next like AI psychology thing, it's pretty common in the comment threads that sometimes people ask me like, why do you use honeybees and why is everything black and yellow and why is it be your logo? It's because I knew I wanted the channel to be about artificial intelligence when I first started it. And it's because they represent one of the most remarkable examples of collective intelligence when they actually choose to find a new hive. It's basically just random sampling of the environment. But even with that tiny little brain, they can tell if the spots that they might go to are actually big enough for everybody, if they're exposing themselves to some kind of danger, and if they're exposing themselves to weather. But the real magic comes when they come back to the old hive. First scout comes back and everybody in the hive just like looks at him. And the scout communicates what he found through what they call a waggle dance, but it's really a, an energy level, like an excitement level. If that bee is enthusiastic and like bees have a baseline for like how much energy they usually use, but if he's like just going crazy, like someone who's just like really excited about something, they pay attention. But they also are like, let's wait for the other scouts in case someone else is even more excited. Like, and it's just built into their biology, into their brain to just keep checking a whole bunch of scouts until enough of them have actually come back that they think to themselves, well, okay, this is probably the best out of everything that we random sampled. And then more scouts actually go to that location and come back and then they have a sort of energy level too. And if pretty much dozens and dozens of bees keep going to this location and they all sort of have that same instinct that like this is a good spot and no other part is sort of coming in with more collective intelligence about that location, then there's just an emergent property or a tipping point or this moment where the whole system is like, we're all going, this is it, we're on the move. And once it's on the move, it's on the move. And it's just got this blockchain like collective intelligence that just seems so underutilized in the world. And at the end of the day, it just works. Like bees find really good spots to set up their hive. And all of that is possible with a group of bees that all have brains this big. So we should be able to have collective intelligence that is much more advanced. All right, look, we're off the bees. That was a, that was a one-off, just, you know, forgive me. We're back to artificial intelligence. This paper is called Rethinking the Scale for In-Context Learning. And basically it just asks, is bigger better when it it comes to these AI models. Damn! And we know that the big models like ChatGPT that have trillions of parameters are getting a lot of attention and it does seem like you can just scale this stuff up and they get smarter and smarter. But this paper looks at how models learn from context. Now context is a broad term and there's so many ways you can think about context. It all depends on the data that you're feeding it. But as an example, imagine just asking ChatGPT to write a paragraph in the voice of a pirate. It can do that and it's impressive because the only context that you gave it was a small little line, speak like a pirate. But this study is interesting because some Amazon data scientists decided to find out, is it every part of the big parameter model that's actually necessary? Basically like what parts of the, you know, essentially digital brain, the neural network, can you remove and still get that kind of accuracy and which parts when you remove them mess it up? So in this paper, they start with a big 66 billion parameter model and they just start doing knockout tests. They just 
ch just basically delete big chunks of it and say, does it still work? And surprisingly, you can actually take out a whole lot of pieces before it starts to act stupid. And by the way, there's some really interesting things that have happened to people in the past, like Phineas Gage and other humans that have had to just undergo surgeries or had strokes and had different parts of their brains removed and surprisingly still functional in some ways and then surprisingly unfunctional in ways that you wouldn't expect. And what these Amazon researchers sort of honed in on is that there's something called attention heads. Attention is all you need paper that came out of Google that kind of revolutionized the whole GPT thing. And the attention architecture that's actually on my shirt here, that says a lot about where the focus should be when new data is coming into the model. What's the important part? What should we pay attention to and which should we give less importance to? I don't know if you can see at the bottom of my shirt, attention is all you need. But when there's input data, there's different attention heads. So these scientists decided to just take away the ones that were ranking least important to see if it still worked. But there's multiple attention heads and some have lower probability. So the researchers started taking out the ones that seemed less important to see if it still functioned well. And they found that even after taking away a lot of these attention heads, other parts of the model could step in and learn from context pretty well. So they could still do pirate talk. And this is one of those things that we need further research on because they could mix and match the different attention heads and they could get different results and there might be some kind of magic in there that we could still explore. Potentially leading to future models that are much smaller to train, easier to work with, but still just as good. All right, now let's talk about a good friend of ours, GPT-4. Turns out uh, she's getting stupid. So there's a surprising decline in GPT-4's math skills. What's going on here? So GPT-4 is the best and most prevalent large language AI model out right now. And some researchers have been evaluating its performance and behavior since March up until early this month, which is June, to see how smart it's been getting from its feedback. And if you're worried about AI taking over the world, I have some good news for you because it's actually not getting smarter. And absolutely shocking to me, with all of this human feedback and all of this extra data that they have, its performance and behavior has decreased. And I'm not kidding, I don't know how that's possible, but this is the study. It came from Stanford and UC Berkeley. It's called, How is ChatGPT's Behavior Changing Over Time? And it seems like they did a good job. It's well-documented. They used four diverse tasks for evaluation, solving math problems, answering sensitive or dangerous questions, generating code and visual reasoning. And you know, there is a significant amount of variance in behavior, so maybe that's what the answer is. But GPT-4 could identify prime numbers with 97.6% accuracy back in March. And now in July, it's gone down 2.4%. GPT-4 is now less responsive also to sensitive questions. Now the authors point out that that could just be because of safety implementations, but that one had explained the code generation errors that are now occurring that weren't in March. And if you have any idea why ChatGPT is getting dumber over time, leave it in a comment below. But honestly, that makes no sense to me because Millions of people, actually a hundred million people have signed up for ChatGPT. Countless of them have given the thumbs up or the thumbs down button, so it should be getting smarter. They've also spent a ton of money hiring expert coders and different data labelers. They're getting more expert feedback. They're getting a more diverse. With all this attention they've had on them, they've really been trying to make this thing better, fast. I mean, Microsoft's been pouring a bunch of money into it, trying to make it smarter and better and faster. Like, how is this possible? I don't know, we'll give it another six months. Maybe it's just variation. Okay, so next up, I found a really interesting study about how ChatGPT thinks about our human history. World History Through the Lens of AI is an exploration by Yini Young. She did some experiments where she dived into what is it that some of these large language models actually know about our human history. Her experiments used three large language models. So the Falcon 40B Instruct model, OpenAI's GPT model, and Anthropic's Claude model and ask them to list the top historical events from three random years. In this case, 610, 1848, and 1910, and to do it in six languages each time. So the aim was to kind of explore, do they have a Western or Eastern bias? What do they actually interpret as the top historical events? And does that change depending on the language of the prompt and the output? So we'll use Young's 1910 for an example. So 1910 is important in Korean culture because it marks the beginning of the Japanese occupation, right? That's a very significant event, but in Western culture, it didn't even register as one of the top events for that year. However, when it's prompted in Korean, one of the three models did list it as the most important event of the year, which just 
just on its face is interesting. Like you wouldn't think that prompting it as the language would actually give it context to how to redistribute history to you, but it does. And then the more I thought about it, I guess that is, that's a signal about what it is that you want, just simply the language that you use when you talk to it. I just never thought about that before. I assumed it would have been the same everywhere, but it's an interesting read, but overall there is definitely a Western bias to these models. And it highlights how there can be potential biases that we wouldn't even notice. So now let's ask the question, does AI surpass students in creative thinking tests? Well, OpenAI's GPT-4 chatbot has demonstrated some incredibly creative outputs before. In fact, on average, they can match about the top 1% of humans. And that's according to this new study that came out of the University of Michigan. Okay, so ChatGPT was tested using something called the Torrance Tests of Creative Thinking, which was administered by Dr. Eric Guzik. So the test involved 24 students from the University of Montana, plus another 2,700 students across the US that have taken the TTCT test in 2016, so they had a baseline to go off of. And then ChatGPT's performance was measured. Drum roll, please. It was not only on par with the creative thinking of the humans, but it outperformed them by a significant margin. This creative thinking test evaluated several mental characteristics, such as fluency, originality, elaboration, resistance to closure, abstractness of titles, and a creative strengths checklist. The AI model scored in the top percentile for fluency and originality, but it did slightly underperform on the flexibility measure. And that gauges the variety of the different types and categories of ideas overall. So there's still one measure that we went at for now. And the article's an interesting read. In fact, Dr. Guzik expresses a lot of surprise. Like he didn't think that ChatGPT was gonna generate that kind of creativity because it's normally a trait that people associate with human imagination. He also noted that GPT-4 made significant advances over GPT-3, worlds different. So if you're a ChatGPT Plus subscriber with access to GPT-4 and you want something creative, make sure to go to the GPT-4 model. So now let's talk about if a universal algorithm for learning can even exist, which if true means we need to debunk the no free lunch exists theorem. Manuel Brenner explained in this article why there is kind of a free lunch when it comes to AI, how there actually might be a universal algorithm for learning. But to understand his position, first we need to understand the no free lunch theorem, which states the opposite, that there's no general learning algorithm that can do most things. That argument is basically on the fact that different types of data have different patterns in them, different algorithms can detect different patterns, so there's never gonna be one universal answer. But in the article, Brenner points out that there is one very contrary example, and that's the human brain. So pointing to to neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to reorganize itself, in response to a sensory loss suggests that the same algorithm might be running in different parts of the brain, even though they seem like different parts of the brain do vastly different things. And if the human brain's computations are underpinned by a universal learning algorithm, maybe in computer science, we can find the equivalent to run on silicon. In fact, you can almost argue that a GI, artificial general intelligence, when AI becomes like basically sentient or like at least as good as humans at most tasks, might just be the point when we come up with an algorithm that can be applied everywhere on everything and embodied in every type of device. And if you wouldn't mind using your universal algorithm inside your brain to help me get to 5,000 subscribers, I would really appreciate it if you smash that subscribe button.